Frank, it's great to have you here on the Thank Pilot you. Academy. I appreciate you joining us sure. today. So, Frank, tell us how you got into management, because we're, we're, I know you're a leadership and management guru. Uh, how did you get into management in the first place? It's quite by accident, actually. Um, I was mopping floors while going to college, and the director of the department noticed how I handled patients and said, you know what, would you take a position as supervisor? I said, sure. So I continued to go in college. As a matter of fact, because it was hospitality, I talked them into letting me do an internship at the hospital rather than a hotel. And they bought into it and um, kind of stayed in healthcare for the next 35 years. That's a great story. I've, I've never heard anybody take a career path from hospitality management and then go into, into hospitals. Typically, the pathway is into working for a hotel yeah, company. It's not what I wanted. It's not what I thought where I'd be. So when you started college, you were thinking hotels and... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, lo I love hotels. Yeah. I love being in them. I like looking at them. Um, hotels just remind you of travel and yes. not being home. So all, yeah. all that good stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, my, mine was a little bit different. I started in hotels and then I ended up in hospitals. So you beat me to the hospital game. Wow. Okay. So that's great. So what was your... When you, when you, so you graduated from, from college with yes. a hospitality degree. Yes. And you're already working in the hospital that yes, you've been Yes, I was already working at? in a hospital. And, and you stayed um, there? Yeah, and I've stayed there ever since. <clears throat> and I've so, worked at many different hospitals in New York and New Jersey, um, constantly getting promoted, going to different positions, all within support services. But I stayed in operations pretty much for my whole career. What were, what were the things that you experienced in, in college when you were working? And in, in what was the actual job task that you were doing you know, at that time? Well, my promotion was um, handling environmental services, cleaning of patient rooms, operating rooms, and also handling the transport of patients to and from x-ray, physical therapy, et cetera. Right. So in order to be successful in, in any career that you're doing, I mean, it's always been my, my thing, you know, pick the place where you want to work. So what, what is a young, you know, 22-year-old, what did you see about hospitals that you thought, oh, this is kind of cool, I want to be here. Well, I thought hospitals at the time had a higher purpose. Right. I thought, you know, we're in the business of getting sick people well, so it doesn't get much better than that. It certainly wasn't to be rich because, as everyone knows, I mean, hospitals can be, healthcare is a, is a great uh, career path, but certainly it's not one that, you know, you're going to um, be a millionaire or billionaire. Right. But that sense of purpose and, I, I guess, giving back, is that kind of how you look Absol at it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Most of the people you're surrounded, the nurses, the doctors, they're all into the same thing. Right. Getting people out of the beds, back home, and back into their lives. You know, when you stop and think about, you know, a hospital environment, the objective is very clear. It's like you have a sick person walk in the hospital and you want them to be well when they walk out. I mean, exactly. And you distill it down to it, that's, that's what this is all about. Exactly, exactly. Versus hospitality, which could be a number of things that go on, and it's very transactional. Right, right. right. That's interesting. So <clears throat> tell us about, you know, some of the, let's say, some of the career development opportunities that you were presented as you were coming up and, 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 and how... How it, where, where it got you in, in, the, in the scheme of things? Well, position. unfortunately, oftentimes it was a result of um, a reorganization. Um, they would meet with me on a Friday and say, guess what, Frank, on Monday you're going to be taking over telecommunications or you're going to be handling transport as well. We went through a, uh, you know, a purge uh, and, and there's no longer that director in place. So they kind of threw me into the hornet's nest. And um, although that presented some challenges, you find that you can actually um, produce a whole lot more than you thought. It's interesting. It seems like people who have had operational type jobs that are task driven, that have a, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end, it sort of starts wiring your brains on how to get things done. So you just mentioned you know, telecom. It's like, what did you ever know about telecom taking over that department prior? I didn't. All I thought they would do was answer the phones. Um, needless to say, I didn't realize the amount of uh, electronics in the telecommunications department, all the alarms that go off for oxygen and fire. These, these ladies and men had a lot of responsibility, so right. it was a learning curve. That must have been pretty exciting, pretty interesting also. Uh, 
exciting wouldn't be the word I'd no. choose, but yeah, it's a little nerve-wracking <laughs> until you, you know, again, there's that, that, you know, you have to make some mistakes before yeah. you get good at anything. So. Yeah. So what other departments have you overseen? Well, I've been in charge of food services, security, plant maintenance. Once again, one day my boss came to me and said, Frank, as of Monday, you're taking over plant maintenance. I'm not an engineer. I'm a business major. So if there's anything that strikes fear into your heart, it's being in charge of the air conditioning <laughs> and, the, and the condensers and everything else that goes along with plant maintenance. Right. But again, over time, you learn. It yeah. means you have to trust a lot as well. I really had to trust my staff. One of the most complicated uh, construction projects I have ever watched and, and understand what's going on is in a hospital. I mean, I don't think, you know, it looks all beautiful. In many cases, you walk in, it all looks nice. But behind those walls, oh, my goodness, there's a lot of pipes. There's a lot of, there's different gases. There's different things going through that building. I mean, it's a very complicated piece of real estate. Hospitals are cities. I was always the mayor of that city. <laughs> I really would rarely go to lunch because if people saw me, they'd seize the moment, said, I've been waiting to talk to you. Whether it's the phone's not working or the place wasn't clean or the boilers, it wasn't cold enough in the ORs. It's service, and that's what you buy into when you are in operations. So what did you do? I mean, that's a lot of real estate to, to cover and a lot of responsibility. So how did you set that up so you could be successful and do the job? I needed my key people to be able to do their job. Right. I needed to give them a little bit of leeway. I allowed them a little bit of independence. And quite frankly, people thrive on that freedom to make choices and not be micromanaged. It, you know, it's, that's an interesting thing that you bring up because it's been my experience. I've seen two styles of management, basically. There are... There are those that are the micromanager, which is really a suffocating situation, and you almost feel um, you're almost afraid to do anything right. because you have no idea what their reaction is. Versus someone like yourself, who you just said, you know, give them give them some latitude, give them the ability to make decisions. It. Why do you think there's such a difference in management styles, and, and what do you think we can do to kind of shake that up and get people to realize that? It's not about micromanagement. It's about building your people up. It's all about training yeah. or lack of. Listen, when I first started out, they spent a lot of time developing us, pulling in universities and colleges nearby. Before you even step foot into a leadership position, mm -hmm. you're well-trained. We've walked away from that. And now mm. we promote people and we let them flounder and then ask why the people aren't motivated. Right. It doesn't work that way. No, it really doesn't. You know, it's definitely, there's definitely a skill set involved with being in management and leadership. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's a people business, isn't it? It's really just uh, no question. interaction of people. No question. It, it, it's bothersome to think that there are people in leadership positions, although I should say senior management positions, because you're not really being a leader if you are micromanaged. Let's face it, you, all you're doing is, annoying people and scaring people off if right. you're so there's no leadership there it's just a senior management position right. but it's amazing how many people end up in these senior leadership positions and they really don't understand the first thing about working with others the answer is in front of their face what people really want is some independence autonomy they want some self-mastery give them a job that they can be good at right and give them a higher purpose Tell them the part they play in the overall objective of the organization. Let them be part of the mission. Right. You know, <clears throat> I was a department head in a hospital uh, at one point also in, in food service. And, you know, one of the things that always amazed me was, you know, there's, there's two sides in the hospital world. There's the clinical side and then there's the support services. Right. Right. But the one thing that we, that we know is that if food service doesn't show up and nobody eats, it's chaos. If EVS doesn't show up and things aren't clean and the toilets aren't clean and the trash isn't empty, it's chaos. And, and there's infection prevention gets in. I mean, all these things that happen as a result of not having good support services. And yet, 
in many cases, we're not really paying attention to that side of the business or giving them the tools for success or something as simple as Pine Alpha Academy to train them how to take the trash out. There's no question, it's the missing piece. We have not told our staff just how important they are, whether they're moving the garbage out, they're preparing a salad, or they're standing watch in the main lobby with security. Mm -hmm. We've not done a good job of explaining what role they play in the success of any, any hospital, any organization. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So what would you tell a young person today? So, you know, we, we see a lot of stories in the news and maybe in the neighborhood or talking to, you know, other parents and things. There's a lot of young people are struggling, like, you know, what do they want to do and, and where do I go and how do I get a rewarding career? I mean, you know, you're, you've been in, in healthcare for, for a long time. So what would you say to a, a young person coming out of high school today? It's like, hey, here's a career path and here's why. What would you say to them? Well, it's not as big a leap as you think to go from mopping floors to being a CEO. People do it all the time. People start out doing very mundane. I started out at McDonald's, and then you learn the things that need to be learned on the job, and right. if you do your best and you show some leadership potential, there's a lot of steps that can be taken so you can make a career out of these jobs. There's no doubt about it. You know, I think it's inspiring when, when people can hear the stories of somebody who started out in, in an hourly position doing, you know, a physical work or whatever, and then, you know, fast forward five, ten years, and suddenly you see them in a, in a very high leadership uh, position. Um, I had the pleasure of working with someone who started out, uh, she had her certified dietary manager, you know, certificate, and I think she had an associate's degree. And, and then, you know, she stuck with this job, she moved her way up, she got a master's in hospital administration, and now she's the CEO of a, of a rehab company with multiple locations around the state of Wyoming. And she started out in food service. Those so, stories <clears throat> abound, okay? Yeah. People aren't willing to start at the bottom these days. And that's how you learn and grow. Um, you gotta be willing to do some of that work because as you get promoted, you don't forget where you started right. and what it takes to clean a hospital, to prepare food. Um, that's really paramount if you're gonna become a great leader. And, and that, I think, also, it, it goes to that empathy aspect of being a great leader. Yes. You know, because you can, you can confidently either say or know, I've done that job and I know what it takes. I see the faces on our trainees when my partner and I talk about what we've done. We didn't just come out of the womb as instructors. Right. We went, we rose through the ranks the hard way. We've mopped the floors. We've done all that work. And all of a sudden, I watch them relax, like, oh, so you understand what we go through? Yeah. The answer is, yeah, we do. We've walked in your shoes before. Actually, we've walked more than a mile. Him and I have walked thousands of miles in your shoes. Right. So tell me, let's, I, I want to hear about your, your last job in a hospital, and then, and then I, want to take, I want you to take us on this journey of destiny training partners. Sure. So what was your last position uh, held in a hospital? I was director of support services. I had responsibility for environmental services, for telecommunications, for groundskeeping, and for the linen operation. What was the census like in a place like that? Or, or well, it was a 350 at? bed facility. Our census was 70 to 75 percent, okay. typically. So it was a busy place. It was a busy place. Nice. How many, how many team members did you have total? We had about 145 altogether. Who did you report to in the organization? At, at that level. I reported to the Vice President of Support Services. Then you saw an opportunity, I'm, I'm assuming, to uh, you know, tell, tell us about the journey with Destiny Training Partners. How did you end up in that role? Well, that happened quite by accident. Um, I was at a conference in Las Vegas, and Tom Peters, a motivational speaker, mm -hmm. he opened up his 30-minute presentation with asking us who in this room developed their frontline supervisors. Out of maybe 2,000 people, only two people raised their hand. He said, shame on all of you. Right. These are the people that are dealing with your employees and your customers, and you're not training them. You're not ex uh, expanding their career at all. And that's when Destiny Training Partners was born. I thought, that's a niche that I have to fill because I knew we was right. We don't pay any attention to them. 
It's, it really is true. You know, I, we talk a lot about, you know, having attention on the frontline staff, but in, in my conversations with you, it's, it's, it's been about the supervisor. It's sort of that, that position, it's still an hourly position, but it's elevated and not quite a manager, but they're the one that are actually out there running the teams every day. And suddenly, when you, when you look at it from that perspective, that person is gold. I mean, you cannot operate or have success without a, an effective supervisor. They make, they make the magic. The secret sauce is having a well-trained leadership team on that front line, and that's where employees can be motivated. Right. That's where employees can be successful. I know in a kitchen, you know, that position is called a sous chef. And, you know, depending on how big the operation is, like if you're in a big hotel or, or whatever, I mean, that sous chef literally is running the kitchen every single day. And that is who everybody's going to, you sure. know? And, and when I reflect on that, I, I see your point. It's like, yeah, it's, it's great to be the executive chef. There's a lot of advantages to that, and, but it's also a lot of responsibility on the finance side and all that. But when it comes to day-to-day -day operations, it's that sous chef. It's bottom up. Yeah, right. it really is, isn't right. it? What was the journey for, for Destiny? So how did you, what, what was your objective and, and what's the mission? Well, our objective was to fill that gap. Our, mm -hmm. our objective was to create a program that would deliver to them the kind of skills they need to be great leaders. You know, to teach them how to build a team, help them resolve conflict, mm -hmm. uh, teach them what employees really want from their job, how to engage employees, performance management. And then what is emotional intelligence? How does that play in all of these skills. Mm -hmm. And so we've crafted programs, and we've been doing this for about 12 years now. And that has morphed into customer service training, and we do technical training. So one thing led to another. Our, our clients would say, oh, could you train people on this? And mm -hmm. we'd say, well, sure, of course we can do that. And all of a sudden, we have all these different businesses within tra Destiny Training Partners, but keeping with the training component. And, and at the end, you know, leadership and management, regardless of the market segment or, or whatever industry you work in, is still people skills, isn't it? Absolutely. So really, the subject might be different, but the actions are the same. Absolutely. So <clears throat> here we are, and in, in, in we're going into 2023. Uh, we live in a new digital age here. Uh, things have evolved since you and I started in our careers, right? Yeah. And so... You know, how does Destiny Training, you know, look at the digital world and how you move forward and, and what, what are the tools that you see that are going to be available to help your clients and, and, and train the, the future supervisors? Well, quite, quite frankly, that was what it was so attractive about teaming up with um, Pineapple Academy is we didn't have that kind of technology. We were strictly focused on that leadership skill component. Uh, and... Pineapple Academy offered us that quantum leap into technology and also that, that whole national approach, uh, right. which we couldn't offer. Um, it takes a lot of time and expense when we fly to other parts of the country. They could spend as much in airfare and, and other expenses as they do for our training. Mm -hmm. the, the kind of technology that Pineapple offers allows us to get into places that we would never have thought possible. You know, one of the things that gets me most excited about, you know, working with groups like Destiny Training Partners is working with professional people who have been there, done the work, really understand what it takes to put out a, a superior product and have a sustainable product and be able to capture that all in film. Because, you know, a, a lot of our peers they fade out in the sunset, right? Sure. They end up going out of Florida or whatever, you know, whatever sure. that dream they have that they sure. want to go do. And then they walk away with, you know, 30, 40 years of knowledge and experience and it's gone. Yeah. It's not shared with anybody. Right. And, and it's sometimes it's difficult to express that to young people or other folks like, this is like, you, you can't take 40 years of experience doing something and then replicate that and think you're going to know that when you're 22 years old coming right. out of college. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's unrealistic expectation. Yes, you can be excited to be passionate. You can be all these things. Right. But sorry, experience in, in that have been, you know, been there, done that. There's something to that that, that it is, you can't replicate. Right. 
that need for instant gratification. Mm -hmm. uh, every everybody just wants that get rich quick scheme. It doesn't work that way. No. Um, experience really teaches you a lot of lessons along the way. It's a lot of mistakes that get you to a position where now you know differently. Right. Now you can offer to other people. And it's pretty amazing to leave a legacy behind. What did you do to change the organization that you were right. for? Right. And, and, and what's really nice about it is now it's in a video format where it can be watched anytime, any place, by anyone, and that information is there so that the people watching it don't have to make the same mistakes we made. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. We, we can streamline that process and put them in the basket a lot faster than fumbling around and figuring it out on your own sometimes. It's an attractive concept to us. Yes, I, I think it, it, it's very nice. You know, I, I, and, the, and the thing is, and, and I tell people this often, and is there'll, there'll never be anything that replicates one-on-one -on -one engagement with, with another human being. You know, videos will never do that. It, it's impossible. AI will never do that, right. that one-on-one. -on -one. But videos can get you far down the road, particularly if you have a mentorship program at work where you're working with young people to show them you know, what, what to do. Right. It's a great way to augment what we should be doing on a regular basis, like coaching people. But this whole video idea is a way to hardwire these concepts into the heads of all these future leaders.